The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And Clearview Cyclones. Clear the air and breathe easy. Now, the cool thing with these I Can Do That projects is not only do they focus on a simple set of tools, they focus on important and fundamental joinery. And in this case, you have to make these sort of interlocking finger joints on the knife block that really reinforce the same techniques that you would use to make dovetails. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing to do in a slightly simpler version. And, and again, reinforcing the fundamentals. So the one they made was out of oak, and I'm gonna use this big old honking slab of maple back here. If you can, I recommend getting one that is the full width, so you don't have to do any sort of glue up to get the nine inch width that you need to make this. Now, keep in mind, if you have a smaller set of knives, you don't necessarily need to make yours nine inches tall. You could bring it down a little bit, but I'm gonna go for the full nine because I happen to have a piece here that's about nine and a quarter. The challenge though, is I don't have anything that can joint this width. I only have an eight inch jointer, so this exceeds the capacity of my jointer. So we're gonna to have to use some hand planes to clean up one side, and then I'll be able to pass it through the planer to clean up the other side. So it's something we haven't really done much on the show, but it's a great way to flatten at least one side without going nuts with the hand tools, just doing enough so that you can use your power tools if that's the way you choose to go. It's certainly the way I'm gonna go. So uh, let's just dive right in and start hacking away at this piece of maple. I should be able to get all four pieces out of this one chunk of maple. Normally I'd start by jointing one face, but as you can see, my joiner isn't wide enough, so I'm going to have to flatten one face with a hand plane. Now if there's a cup in the board, I can save time by keeping the cup side up while hand planing. With the board firmly secured in my vise, I mark the entire face with a marker to help gauge my progress. And if all goes as expected, I'll only remove material from the outside edges. I start by taking quick light passes across the grain from the inside out with my number five. And I repeat the process on the other side. Now if the board is pretty flat to begin with, we shouldn't have too much to worry about. But I check my progress just to see if there's any high spots and I mark them with the marker again. Now these are the areas that I'll focus my attention on in the next round of planing. Now even if we end up with two flat and straight outside edges, that certainly doesn't mean that they're both in the same plane, so I check across the grain for any major issues. And now I just clean up the high areas. Now at this point, I like to take a few passes with the grain to make sure that it's flat and smooth across the length of the board. When I get a full length shaving, I can be pretty confident that the surface is nice and flat. Once again, I check my progress and make any adjustments as needed. Now keep in mind, this is a very quick and dirty way of doing this process. I don't need absolute perfection and I don't really need a set of winding sticks here. I just need the board to lay flat and stable as I pass it through the planer. Now with the plane side down, a couple passes through the planer flattens the other side. A quick flip and a single pass gives us a board with two flat and parallel faces. A quick trip to the joiner gives me a 90 degree edge, and finally I can slice the board in half with the bandsaw. After resawing, the faces do tend to warp a little, so a couple passes with the hand plane again gets things ready for the planer. And now I use the planer to bring the boards down to a half inch thick. 
At the table saw, I trim the boards down to 9 inches wide. Then each board is cross cut to create two sides, and a stop block ensures accuracy. Using the diagram in the plan as reference, I lay out the joinery on one of the larger side pieces. And instead of laying it out again on the second piece, I simply transfer the marks directly by butting them up against each other. Now because of the risk of cross grain tear out, I'm using the marking gauge to score my reference line. This will also help later when it's time to do the chiseling. Now we're going to cut out the waste with a jigsaw. Get a blade that has really fine teeth like the one on the left. The one on the right would just be too aggressive. Slowly make each cut, keeping your blade in the waste area, and don't go all the way to the back line. It's hard to keep the saw perfectly level, and it's very likely that your blade is going to travel further than you realize on the underside where you can't see it. Now to get the material out from between the fingers, make several relief cuts, and then a couple cuts across the grain to clean the bulk out. Again, don't go right up to the line. Now in the article, the Schwarz recommends measuring the base of the jigsaw and using a straight edge as a guide. Now I don't know about you guys, but running a jigsaw along a straight edge has never really worked for me. Maybe it's just the way I'm doing it. But I tried it, and of course, my blade wandered. Now you can actually see my little screw up right here. So I won't be doing that again. So if you want my recommendation, take your time and go freehand. You can clean everything up with a chisel later on. Now to do the final cleanup on these joints, you'll need a nice sharp chisel. Begin by clamping down the board on a sacrificial surface and start chiseling away the excess. Once you have as much removed as possible, rest the chisel on the score line and chop down firmly. Just don't go more than halfway. Once we get that crisp line established, we're going to flip the board over and repeat the process on the other side. Once both sides are cleaned up, I use a small chisel to pare away any remaining stock in the middle. And don't worry if you dish it out a bit, that won't affect the final fit and finish in any way. And it's a good idea to check your progress with a square. And now it's time to transfer our joinery to the smaller side pieces. Just stack one side on top of the other and transfer the locations of the fingers using a blade or a sharp pencil. At this point, there could be some slight variation from joint to joint, so it's important to label each one and keep the orientation straight. Cutting the joinery for these pieces is exactly the same as before, so there's no need to show it again. But remember, cut on the waist side of the line, and that's absolutely necessary if you want a decent fit. After a test fit, you can use the chisel to make any adjustments that are necessary. I lucked out today because I had almost no adjustments to make. And finally, each piece gets a thorough sanding. Now, if you're relatively new to woodworking, you may not realize that the process we've just gone through is very similar to cutting hand-cut dovetails. Now, I use the jigsaw for some of it, and you might use a handsaw if you're actually cutting dovetails so you can get a really nice, fine, controlled cut. But really, the process is almost exactly the same. So pat yourself on the back if you got this far, because it really is just like dovetails. Now, the knife, uh, the knife block is a relatively simple project. It's not really the kind of project that you want to get too uptight about absolute perfection. It's a fun project. It's a simple project. You can knock it out in a weekend. And it's one of those projects that, I don't know, sometimes I kind of like to throw perfection to the side and sometimes work on a little bit of speed. Let's see how fast I can get this done and still get decent, acceptable results. So what I'm noticing here is the wood has moved a little bit since I cut it and I planed it down yesterday and did the joinery today and you know my climate it's so dry that things can change very quickly. So I've got a little bit of warping to deal with but I don't think it's it's anything I won't be able to clamp out during the glue up. The other thing to notice on mine there is uh, there are a few places where the blade on the jigsaw veered off course and went off you know on a slight angle. That's one of the risks you're going to run by using a jigsaw for this operation. So I recommend staying a little bit further away from the line and just use your chisel later to chisel right back to your scribe line. And one other thing that I did um, when I was marking mine out, and I mentioned before it's very important that you know exactly what side of the line to cut on. 
Now the first round of cuts we did on these pieces, right? It doesn't exactly matter. I could actually have taken the chisel and I could have gone back a whole nother quarter inch and opened that up. The important thing is to make sure that when I transfer this to my other piece, that's the one that I need to get absolutely perfect. So this can be any length, any dimension we want it to be. But when I scribe the lines on here, now I need to know what side of that line am I gonna cut on. And the rule of thumb, and this goes for when you cut dovetails as well, the rule of thumb is to keep your blade in the waist area, okay? So if this is the waist, we would want our blade to be on this side of the line. And you wanna make sure that you leave that line. I do not wanna consume the line with my blade. And that's just kind of a rule of thumb. And what that winds up doing is some of the joints may be just a little bit too tight, but at least none of them will be too loose. And as an example, I did do one of them, just wasn't really paying attention and I cut my line and actually went into my pencil line and it wound up being a loose joint. Well, that's just the way things go. I'd rather, again, have tight fitting joints and chisel back, pair it back to the absolute perfect fit as opposed to having a joint that's too loose. But once again, I just wanna stress that this is really not the kind of project that you need to worry about absolute perfection. It's a skill building project that brings you up to the next level. So now all I need to do is round over these edges because these are gonna sit proud on each side. So we wanna just kinda ease the corners a little bit, makes them look a little bit nicer. And we need to cut uh, a little piece for the bottom, but that gets inserted afterwards. So uh, after that, the next step will be the glue up. Okay, so for the glue up, I've got some epoxy. One of my little Dixie cups here, and I'm using a high density filler. The slow setting epoxy is very loose, very runny. So I like to use some of this, it's basically a white powder filler. And it thickens it up a little bit, makes it a little less likely to uh, run all over the place while I'm doing this glue up. It's pretty light colored. So give it a good mix. Okay, so now that's consistency I'm a little bit more comfortable working with. So just uh, start painting the joints and putting this thing together. You can see it takes a little bit longer than you might expect to get all these areas covered sufficiently. So a slow setting glue, it's not just a good idea, but might just be necessary. If you're racing the clock at this point, you're looking at a potentially bad glue up, which is never, never fun at this point in the game. Get some clamps in there and then we will check it for square. Okay, the clamp isn't going to fit here. It's touching the uh, outer fingers. So just got a couple pieces of scrap. Tape them to that surface. See another good reason for that slow setting glue. You see, we still have a gap here. So even though we've got the pressure applied on that side, it looks like it's almost all the way over, but not quite. It still needs some help here. This little box is gonna get a lot of clamps. Now before I tighten everything all the way down, I need to close up this gap here. is starting to look like some kind of a puzzle, but you really do need all this extra clamping pressure. So it looks like we're nice and square, which is good. Now with a, a setup like this, if those joints are each cut nice and square, nice and straight, you shouldn't have a problem with it being out of square. 
uh, once you apply clamping pressure, it's kind of like a self-squaring setup. So uh, fortunately that worked out for us. And what I would recommend doing though is checking for square after you apply maybe two or three clamps when you still have an opportunity to do something about it. And most of the time, if, it's, if it is a little bit out, you can kind of just, even with your hands, just kind of tweak it into position and then reapply your clamping pressure. So we're good in pretty much every direction. So fortunately, we don't have to make any adjustments. If I did have anything major to do, I'd probably take three or four clamps off. And if nudging it doesn't work, then you take one of these clamps and you clamp from corner to corner, uh, whichever one is the offending corner, and you kind of skew it into the, the proper shape. So I let that dry overnight, and of course we've got a little bit of cleanup to do. I couldn't quite get a rag or anything in there with all those clamps on it. But that's okay, a little chisel and a scraper should be enough to get any of that excess uh, epoxy off. But the really important thing now is that we actually get this thing so that it sits nice and flat. And almost inevitably, there's gonna be a little bit of unevenness there. So put it down on a surface that you know to be pretty much flat, and just rock it back and forth. And by doing that, you can tell which corners are high. So when I turn it upside down, I can tell that this corner was a little high and this corner was a little high. So all I really have to do is mark it with my pencil and I can feel a little ridge there. So I know it is slightly skewed. I mark it with my pencil, then I'm gonna put it into the vise and just use a block plane to clean it up. Just a couple passes and just be sure to take more off toward the end. Take a couple extra passes there. Then I'll go a little further. A few more. Easy enough to do. A nice sharp block plane though really makes this a simple task. That is much better. No rock. Now if you've been watching The Wood Whisperer for some time, you've probably seen me make a number of mistakes. And I'm never shy about showing those errors and showing how I go about fixing them. Um, but usually what I wind up coming up with is, is more of a wood solution. If I've got a crack or uh, a gap, I like to fill it with wood when possible. But one thing we don't talk nearly enough about is fillers. And you can make your own at home and get a decent match, but sometimes a commercial filler really is the best way to go and it'll give you the best results. But keep in mind, not all fillers are created equal. If you just go grab something off the shelf at Home Depot, you may not really be uh, happy with the result. A lot of times it doesn't take stain real well, it's got a real nasty odor, and it can shrink and actually crack, and sort of like if you're drywall, uh, doing some mud on a drywall and you put too thick of a layer of mud, it'll shrink and crack as it dries. So what I recommend specifically, this is hands down the best filler I've ever used. I may have mentioned it in the past, it's a Timbermate wood filler. This stuff is uh, made by a company in Australia. It's water-based, it doesn't shrink, it takes stain beautifully, and I find that the colors that they claim, for instance, this one is maple, beech, and pine, because they're all kind of in the same family of color, really does match really well, and it's great for hiding mistakes that you really don't have any other way to fix. So what I've got here is a crack that resulted from that jigsaw little mishap that I had. And I figure, why the heck not? Let's try a little wood filler, see if we can use that as a quick fix, and let's see how the results turn out. Yeah, nothing real complicated here. I'm just gonna drive it into this crack. Now, if you want, you can always use blue tape to mark off some of this wood so that the, uh, the filler doesn't stain the wood. But in this case, I've gotta do some sanding still. I'm really not too worried about it. All right, let's give that a few minutes to dry. So let's clean it up with a little bit of sanding and see how it turned out. All right, not too bad. Bottom line is, this is better than a black gaping hole. With a little finish on there, I think it's actually gonna look pretty good. Now before I apply the finish, let's take a look at the bottom here. And I've already cut this piece. It's just a half inch thick piece of maple that's gonna go right in the center here. Now, you may be wondering, is this gonna cause a wood movement issue? I mean, it could, I guess, but it's gonna live in your kitchen. 
it's only a few inches across, it's probably not gonna be that big of a deal. If you're concerned about it, I would suggest using plywood or use maybe a rift sawn or quarter sawn piece of material that's not gonna expand much across its width. But uh, I'm gonna take my chances here. It's a fun little project, why the heck not? The other thing is as you just place it in there, you're, you're literally just cutting it to size here. There's really nothing tricky. If you can get a nice tight fit, you may not even need anything like brad nails on this because you'll get a decent long grain glue bond along the side of this piece. And that's what I've got here. So yeah, I may shoot a couple of 23 gauge pins or something through there, but I wanna see how well it holds with the glue here. If I get a nice tight fit, I may not need the brads at all. It's a light duty piece, you know? I doubt it's really gonna be much of an issue. Plus, when we put our bamboo sticks or the whatever you wanna call them, the little skewers, in here we're going to be putting a bed of epoxy in the bottom to hold those in place and that epoxy is going to seep into any cracks and corners and everything and sort of just hold everything together down there so not too concerned about securing this bottom any more than what i'm doing here probably going to need a little help of a hammer Now I would leave that panel just about a 64th of an inch proud and this way I could sand, scrape, or use a plane to kind of smooth everything out and just make it look really nice. Now what would have been the more elegant way to have handled this bottom? Well, of course, you could have treated it like a drawer bottom and we could have put a groove all the way around all four sides and had that panel sit inside that groove. Certainly would have been, I think, a better way of doing it, but we're trying to keep things simple here. One of the reasons that would have been complicated is we would have needed to make a stopped groove. Now these two, the skinny sides, the groove can go all the way through because this side here blocks it. You don't see it from the end grain. But what would happen if we put a groove on the inside of this piece all the way across? It would have been visible out here on the end grain. So we would have had to create a stopped groove. And the way that we usually do that is with a router, we just don't go all the way through. And then you could square off the end if you need to with a chisel. So I just wanted to you know, keep it on the simple side and not worry about that right now. And we've covered those things in other shows and um, it's certainly a fundamental thing that you will wanna get good at doing. But in this case, sometimes I just think it's fun to have a project that you don't have to do the very best techniques. You really wanna just reinforce some fundamentals. So this is interesting. This will be a nice little experiment to see how that bottom holds up and if it creates any problems for me later. Honestly, I don't think it will though. So um, I'm gonna let this dry, sand it nice and smooth, and then we could work on the finish. All right, so the finish that we're gonna to use today is General Finishes High Performance. It's water-based, and this is a satin. So all I'm gonna do is pour it through my filter. That'll get any sediment, any impurities, any crap that might be in that can, and filter it all out. This is just a standard paint filter. You guys have seen me use those before. I get them uh, by the case on Amazon pretty cheap. And you can see this stuff is running through pretty quickly, so it's gonna be no problem spraying it straight from the can. I could dilute it a little bit. Uh, with water-based stuff, you don't really wanna go more than like 10% if you're just gonna use water. Uh, you can actually screw up the finish if you go much more than that. So in this case, I don't really think I need to do anything. So as soon as this is done dripping, Close enough. You wonder why my uh, surface on the bench top here looks so dirty. It's because I'm not patient. All right, let's spray. So after about four coats of finish with some sanding in between with uh, 320, 400, and then 600 grit, I end up with a really nice, beautiful, and very simple satin finish. Now we have to look at the bamboo sticks. These are just little skewers that you could buy from a supermarket. I got mine from Walmart. They were about a buck for a bag, and each bag has about 100. It seems like we're gonna need roughly 1,000 or so, if I remember uh, Chris's recommendation correctly. Now, I also had someone, in fact, it was Nerdy Dude from Twitter, who sent me a link to an online source that was even cheaper than that. I only wish I would have gotten that link sooner. But again, if you uh, need to get them locally, you can. Walmart was where I went. So, the problem is, 
you need to cut these guys down. Now, the web source that I saw incidentally had them in shorter lengths, so you may be able to completely skip this step if you do that, but the ones that I have are a little bit too long. Now, cutting these is going to be a little bit tricky. You don't really want to use your miter saw because that can be dangerous as you've got all these little tiny pieces. Um, even if you tape them together, it's still not a great idea, so we're just going to use a hand saw. It's going to be this little fine tooth dozuki. What I like to do is grab some blue tape and just anywhere you can get a good grip. Start rolling the tape around and just get a nice, well, also make sure use the points on a flat surface, make sure everything is nice and even and then wrap it around. That's going to help immobilize everything and keep it nice and tight because otherwise it's going to be impossible to saw. So I double check, make sure they're all down. I'm going to measure I'm going with about eight and eight and one eighth of an inch here. Put a little pencil mark, and then I'm going to cover that area with tape as well. Nice and tight if you can get it. Okay, and since I just covered my pencil mark with my tape, I'm going to transfer the mark again. Now one thing you'll notice, I'm referencing from the pointy side because I want the pointy side to be up. If you look at the pictures, the way Chris did it, he has the, uh, the flat side facing up. And for me, if I'm going to be jamming knives in there, I'm, I'm kind of in favor of something that's tapered. It might accept the knife blades a little bit better. And it's going to be recessed below the surface. I've already cut a few here. They're already about a quarter of an inch below the surface, so there's really no risk of, of poking your finger, getting cut, or anything like that. So uh, I really prefer to have the pointy side up. So let's go ahead and make this cut. We'll take our time. It's not going to be a fast process. Done. So, as you can see, it's going to take quite a few. All right, so to secure all of the bamboo to the bottom of this box here, the easiest thing to do is just drop some glue down there. So it's pretty well sealed up. All I need to do is mix up a little bit of this epoxy. I did a little double shot from my uh, epoxy pumps over there. Added a little bit of this high density filler just to kind of, yeah, I don't want it to be too runny. I want it to at least sit in a puddle on the bottom. Give it a real good mix, and then I'm just gonna pour it in and try and spread it around a little bit. All right, let's pour it in. Well, really, this is pretty self-leveling. Not going to need a whole lot of help here. Okay, and now the fun part, adding the skewers. Now, I guess the easiest thing to do would be to tilt this up on its side and let gravity help us with the skewers. The, the problem I see with that, though, is the epoxy is going to run all over the place. So I will probably get a bunch of these in here and then worry about kind of straightening them out after I get it maybe three quarters full. So I'm going to tilt this up on an angle and see if we can't get these to stack in some sort of orderly fashion. It doesn't have to be perfect. And you can see why at this point it's really important to have a glue 
with a long working time. Because I've got this luxury, taking my time and making sure these are all placed in a way that I want them to be. And you know, you got to think about how many knives are you going to put in this thing. If you've got plans on putting a whole bunch in here, you might want to leave a few extra skewers out. Give yourself a little bit of extra space to work with. And that's probably what I'm going to use mine for is the larger sort of butcher knives. So I will probably keep mine a little bit less packed. You know, what's really fun about this is it's kind of just, it's different. It's different than anything I've ever done using the bamboo skewers, something for the kitchen like this, and something that's actually very practical at the same time. So, you know, projects like this are a nice diversion from the usual stuff that we might make in the shop. And it doesn't help to grease the wheels if your significant other happens to enjoy cooking. It's a nice addition to any kitchen. Well, it certainly wasn't one of the most difficult projects we've ever made, but definitely one of the most fun and memorable. I hope you guys take a chance to build a knife block of your own, and I'd love to see your variations on this theme. I know I've got a few ideas locked in my head that unfortunately I just don't have the time to do right now, but they involve kind of suspending this thing so that it swivels and just, I've got a couple cool little ideas that I'm gonna play with in the future. But for now, we've gotta move on to the wall hanging tool chest, uh, but this is just one of those great little projects that you could knock out in two or three days. So I definitely recommend downloading the plan and building one yourself. So until next time, thanks for watching.